Well, hello everybody. Uh, we're back again for another section. And uh, today we're going to be looking at natural selection. Uh, so I want to start, first of all, with uh, probably one of the most famous examples of natural selection, and that's the peppered moths. Um, this example is going to turn up in uh, most of your textbooks. It has for a hundred years, and it will continue to do so because it's an excellent example. The first thing I want to do is look at this definition. Uh, natural selection refers to the reproductive success of adapted individuals and results in changes of characteristics within a population over time. Obviously, that's a mouthful. That That's a lot of concepts there to try and understand. So I want to unpack that so that we can really get into what natural selection is. And the first thing that I want to draw your attention to is the phrase adapted individuals. If you look at the picture there, you've got a couple of peppered moths. You've got a white one and you've got a black one. And the white one is sitting on a white tree. So I want you to think to yourself, if you were a bird and uh, you were flying around uh, in this environment, which one of those moths would you be likely to eat? So stop the video if you want to think about it. But which one of those moths is going to get eaten most likely by birds? And the answer is going to be the black one. And the reason is because that stands out. The white one has camouflage against the white tree. And so more than likely, it's not going to get eaten. And that, in a nutshell, is what adapted individuals are. The, the white one just happens to be an adapted individual. And this is really important to get down. The white one didn't do anything to get adapted. It just happened to be white. And because of that, we call it an adapted individual because it has the uh, color trait of being white and therefore it's going to camouflage well with the tree. Therefore, it's adapted whilst the black one is not necessarily adapted. So that's the first phrase. The second thing we want to look at is this phrase here uh, where it says uh, talks about reproductive success. What does that mean? Well, again, think about it. If you've got a population here of moths and if the uh, white, uh, the black moth, sorry, are getting, getting, uh, getting eaten, then you're going to have more and more white moths. And if you've got more and more white moths, then the white moths only have other white moths to reproduce with. Uh, there's not as many black moths to reproduce with. Well, that means that the white moths have that reproductive success. They're, they're more successful in uh, mating with each other because there's just more of them. The black moths are disappearing from the population because they're getting eaten. So that's what reproductive success means. And now we know what adapted individuals means. And that brings us to the rest of natural selection. So if white moths then are only left to mate with white moths, that means that more than likely they're going to pass on their alleles or their traits for the color white to their uh, to the next generation. And so that leaves us with the rest of the definition here. It results in changes of characteristics within a population over time. In other words, you're going to have more and more white moths now that are going to proliferate in this particular population. And of course, this happens over time. So that is, in a nutshell, natural selection. And of course, one of the most famous uh, uh, examples would be the finches of Darwin. Uh, Darwin, of course, went out to the Galapagos Islands, and uh, he saw these different finches that had, there were different uh, finch populations on different islands. And he hypothesized that uh, one original species had evolved into several of them. Now, I'm not exactly sure uh, how the story goes, but it's something like this. Uh, there was an original population uh, of finches, say that's number one, uh, which would be this finch right here. And let's just say for argument's sake, they're on the mainland. And then the uh, population two, population three, and population four exist on uh, small islands off the mainland. And so uh, Darwin saw this. He saw these populations of finches on these different, uh, so four different populations on four, at four different locations. And he thought to himself, well, I can't imagine that these finches uh, just were sort of all created in place. Uh, there must be a better explanation. And that brings us to something else that's very important that we need to talk about uh, that was going on historically at the time. 
You see, Darwin, as uh, most scientists of the day, believed in something called fixity of species. Fixity of species basically means that since creation, all organisms remain unchanged. And not only that, those that believed in this believed that each species existed in its particular habitat and had been there since creation. So it's kind of a, we think about it today, it's kind of a strange belief, but uh, all Christian uh, geologists, biologists, scientists, and even non-Christian ones believed in this uh, fixity of species because, you know, the Bible had so permeated science at the time. And Darwin was no exception. He was a man of his time. He believed in fixity of species. So where did this idea come from? Well, I talked last uh, section that we talked a little bit about Plato and Aristotle, and it comes from Plato and Aristotle uh, and Socrates as well. So, of course, uh, uh, Plato uh, is Socrates a, a, a student, and of course Aristotle is Plato's student. And uh, Plato lived in the 5th century BC, and, and Aristotle lived in the 4th century BC. And all of these guys, all three of them, believed in something called essentialism, or some form of essentialism. And essentialism uh, essentially says that all objects possess an essential, unchangeable characteristic. And you can look at different works on philosophy and different words will be used. For example, forms or ideas. All of these uh, concepts, uh, appellations, are very similar to each other, or they're slightly different. So essentialism, essentials, ideas, and forms. The idea is that, that in the world there exist particular things that have some kind of essential, real, universal property in the mind of a supreme being. And Socrates and Plato certainly believe that. Aristotle may or may not have. Uh, he seems to waver on whether or not there was uh, there is a supreme divine being. But anyway, they all believed in this concept of essentialism. So as an example, roundness. Round objects exist in the world today. There's lots and lots of round objects. Tires, wheels, steering wheels are round for the most part. And Plato specifically believed that these objects that we have in the world today are just shadows or types, and they called them particulars, of universals or essentials that were, it sort of existed in heaven. The concept of the perfect round object was only found in heaven. And on earth, we only have sort of things that are close to the perfect round thing, but never actually quite get there. And this is true for everything, including ethics. It was actually Socrates who developed more of an ethical system of ideas or forms. Uh, and Plato developed more of a naturalistic perspective, looking at objects in nature. And this concept of essentialism was passed down through the Church Fathers, Thomas Aquinas, who was a big uh, Aristotelian. Of course, he, uh, he also liked Plato as well. And uh, Augustine loved Plato. He had a lot of Platonic ideas. And this idea was passed down uh, in the Church for thousands of years. And the biologists and scientists and geologists of the day in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, they all adopted this idea of essentialism. And it followed on through into the 19th century with Darwin. And that is where the fixity of species comes from. It comes from a, a Platonic or Aristotelian idea. That is, that uh, there is some essential uh, species of a bird, for example, and it can't change. It, that bird represents some essential form or idea in the mind of God, and it's unchangeable. And of course, we know today that this idea is certainly not true, but this was something that a lot of these, well, all of these guys really believed in. Um, Louis, oh, sorry, not all of them. There were actually a group of scientists uh, called uh, uh, philosoph uh, nature philosophers who actually uh, differed from fixity of species ideas, and we'll have to talk about that another day. But uh, a lot of the scientists, especially those committed to Christian concepts, believed in fixity of species. Uh, Louis Agassiz, uh, he also believed in this. And this is a good book if you want to read. It's a biography on him. And uh, I think uh, Stephen Jay Gould said he was the last real creationist uh, with Louis Agassiz. So uh, this was a quote from the book talking about his fixity of species ideas. The author says, 
when he, uh, uh, Gazi, had hundreds of fishes spread before him on a work table, he insisted on identifying specimens that seemed even the slightest degree different from one another as separate species rather than as variants. And the reason is he didn't like the idea of variants. There was a species, it was created by God, it, it was put by God in that river, in that pond, at the beginning of creation, and that's the end of it. If you find another species uh, uh, over here somewhere, then it had a separate creation. Very, very interesting. And as I'll get onto even more in uh, these lectures as we discuss this, this is very important for what's going on today in creationism because it really affected uh, creationism in a bad way in the years that followed, but more about that later. So this, of course, uh, was something that affected uh, Charles Darwin, this concept of fi fixity of species. And we can only imagine what it would have been like if uh, modern creationists today, of course, we don't believe in fixity of species. In fact, we believe in evolution, natural selection. In fact, a lot of creationists believe in quite substantial change now in organisms. If, if that kind of idea had been back there at that time, then maybe some people might have not jumped boat and jumped fully into the evolutionary camp. Maybe there was th th there might have been uh, a potential third option, but there wasn't an option back then. And so when when Charles Darwin came up with his theory of natural selection, everybody jumped on board because there wasn't really an extra option to jump to. And in fact, if you read Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species, it's actually quite scientific. Uh, a lot of his concepts in there, in fact, all of his science is scientific. It all has to do with microevolution through natural selection. He uses lots of different examples, and he only gives ideas and ideologies about extrapolating that to encompass a single common ancestor for all uh, life on Earth. But his science is pretty solid in the book. If only we had been able to talk to him about this third option at the time, or a lot of the uh, biologists at the time. So anyway, and it's in the midst of all of that, uh, that creationism uh, forms and uh, began to affect the uh, church at large. And again, as I say, we'll get into that another day. All right, so let's do a group exercise here to see uh, how good uh, you are at natural selection. So here is a, a couple of pics. You've got an island here and you've got a, a finch over here, and, and then you've got another finch over here. Now, I've actually extended the beak on this particular finch, uh, so there's no finch that actually looks like that. Uh, but here's the story. Uh, and in, You're an intrepid scientist, and you travel to South America at the age of 20, and when you arrive, you find only finches that have thick, short beaks, such as the example at top left there. You notice that the only source of food is worms, and the worms live everywhere. They live on the ground, they live in the trees, including within the bark on the trees. Now, a hundred years later, you're still an intrepid scientist, and because you know technology is so good, you happen to be 120, and there are no finches with short, thick beaks anymore. Instead, you find only these long-beaked finches. Now, the worms are still there, but now they only live deep within the bark of the trees. They don't exist anywhere else. So I want you to stop the video and see if you can apply natural selection to this uh, fallacious, untrue example um, to see if you understand natural selection. So go ahead and stop the video and see if you can figure that out. Okay, so hopefully you did that uh, and your story should go something like this. When the finches originally arrived at the island, there were lots and lots of these worms. However, as time went by, the finch population grew and ate up all of the worms so that there were only worms now left in the tree bark. Well, that meant that uh, within any population, there is a variant size of the beak. So, uh, for example, the finch beak top left, it wasn't exactly that size down to the millimeter for every single individual. Some had slightly longer beaks, some had slightly shorter beaks. Well, it turns out that the ones that had slightly longer beaks were able to get into the bark. And so they happened to survive, whilst the ones with slightly shorter beaks happened to die. Well, that meant that the ones with slightly longer beaks 
were the only ones around to mate with other ones with slightly longer beaks, which meant that the trait of having a slightly longer beak got passed on to the next generation. And in that next generation that had all slightly longer beaks, again, there's a slight variation in the size of the beak so that other ones had a slightly longer beak again. And so this keeps happening until eventually you end up with finches that look something like the ones at the top, uh, at the bottom left because the worms get deeper and deeper and deeper in the bark of the tree. So that should be what you were thinking regarding this example of natural selection and how it works. Okay, so some, some interesting uh, side notes on this. It turns out that a study of Darwin's finches reveals that uh, new species can develop in as little as two generations. That's a title of a Princeton University article, and this is fascinating. Uh, there is the link uh, if you want to go and look at that study, but essentially scientists from Princeton have been looking at finches. I think it was like the 1980s they started looking at the finches, and they noticed a new species actually evolve in the period of time that they were there. And this new species, I think when they first observed, only had like six individuals, but it now has up to 30 individuals. And this new species has slightly different beak structure and uh, some slightly different other structures. And it also has a different song, which means that the new species will now, will now no longer mate with the other species. What's fascinating about this is that in the same article, the uh, paper goes on to say that the 18 species of finches, including this newest species, uh, have evolved over 2 million years. Now, here's what's interesting. Do the math. we just seen, we actually saw the evolution of a new species, a finch, in about 30 years. If you do the math for the other 17 species and divide that into uh, 2 million years, it turns out that each species, according to that date, or according to that age frame, took 117,000 years to evolve. Do you see the problem? 117,000 years, as opposed to 30 years, which we've actually seen. That's testable science. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that something is wrong with the deep time frame in which they're thinking. Now, I don't know how they got that 2 million year date, but more than likely it comes from some kind of absolute dating method. And it just can't be right. Obviously it can't be right because we've seen finches evolve in 30 years. Therefore, the other 17 species did not take 117,000 years each to evolve. So that's for free, just a really cool piece of information. All right, so what about evolution? And we'll, we'll talk about more of this in later sections. Uh, first of all, Christians should not be afraid or dismissive of the term natural selection. Uh, this is a definition from a dictionary. It says, evolution in its contemporary meaning in biology typically refers to the changes in the proportions of biological types in a population over time. Notice, that's pretty innocuous. It doesn't say anything in it that we should, as Christians, necessarily disagree with. That is evolution. It simply means change over time. Now, I know that there are other definitions of evolution, and that's why we need to be careful with the word, but we shouldn't automatically be dismissive with it. Uh, so here is an example of where it gets confusing. The next two definitions come from the same textbook. So let me read the first one. Evolution is all the changes that have occurred in living organisms due to differential reproductive success hmm, in living organisms, and notice this last part, over geological time. So first of all, it's all the changes that have occurred over geological time or deep time. This is a definition of evolution which would align with Charles Darwin's concept of macroevolution or molecules to man evolution. And so as Christians, we cannot accept that definition. But look at the next definition that they have just a few pages later. Evolution is the change in allele frequencies. That's the example, I've got an example here, uh, of the beak length or the moth color, for example, in a population over time. And nothing wrong with that definition. And yet the same word is used. So uh, this brings me to uh, us as Christians, and for those of you who are into creationism, you simply cannot be bagging on the word evolution without uh, giving people context. 
And so one of the one of the ways I get around that is whenever I talk about evolution in a negative sense, I always put the prefix on it, uh, the prefix word Darwinian evolution. I'll always say I don't believe in Darwinian evolution because by that what I'm saying is I don't believe in one common ancestor for all of life. I do believe in evolution, however. I do believe things change. And of course, as a creationist, I believe that those changes occurred in the kinds that God originally uh, created in, during creation week. But they, they have changed, and sometimes substantially, as we'll still see later. So uh, just be careful with the way in which you construe the word evolution, because remember, the point of anything that you're studying in science is to give God glory. The point is not to win arguments. You need to make friends. You need to be able to introduce people to Jesus Christ. And the way you do that is by bringing down walls that don't necessarily have to be there. Okay, so that is all for this particular lecture. Uh, we're going to get into some aspects of uh, evolution again uh, in the next section. Uh, so uh, please uh, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, uh, to hit the bell as well, like uh, this if you if you thought this video was helpful and uh, I, I've got a book uh, so so look that up as well uh, I've got a, another website I've got a website that, that you can go to www.creationunfolding.com for more resources and I, I think the greatest thing that I would really appreciate from you is prayer if you could pray for me right now uh, that would be much appreciated otherwise I will see you next time thanks and goodbye